Braun foot and I'm going to share some things with you that ran through my head recently um, and the big catalyst for this was reading more Brett Easton Ellis. I've been on a Brett Easton Ellis binge lately. Uh, not too long ago I finished reading his book Glamorama which was published in 1999. It was the one that came just after American Psycho, even though it's actually uh, eight years later. Uh, Ellis is not a not what you would call a prolific novelist. Uh, he writes when he feels prompted to write. And Glamoram is a crazy book. It is uh, just as violent, just as upsetting as American Psycho is, there, there are scenes of absolute carnage that will, that will <laughs> send you, that will send you curling into a fetal position. He is so ruthless in his descriptions of these moments. Um, and, uh, it, it, it got me to thinking <clears throat> because there's so much about the book it's a really good book, I have to add. And But there's so much about the book that seems like it's written by somebody who has insight or knowledge or uh, has some... Let me just put it this way. He, he seems to be wanting to let us know what's going on. Uh, now, I don't know if Ellis would ever admit to that. I don't know if I'm right about that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is just all from his fervid, fevered imagination, just like American Psycho was. But <clears throat> my impression, especially with so many of the themes being about how the fashion industry is just a, just a guise for, um, operations of terror <clears throat> and uh, how so much of what we see and think of as real is actually scripted. It's a book well ahead of its time. I mean, it's pulsing with paranoia <laughs> from a pre-9-11 perspective. It's it, the, the kind of the kind of paranoia it invites to the, the, the reader to entertain is, uh, is very contemporary, has a very contemporary feel to it. <clears throat> but I was thinking just now, just, just uh, in terms of what do novelists know, what do writers, artists know, people who work within the corridors of power, but, but maybe maybe are good guys maybe maybe want to want to expose things and I don't know finally whether Brett Easton Ellis is a good guy or a bad guy or or neither um, but I'm I'm inclined to wonder if he might be somebody kind of like the the the, the writer of uh, True Detective, the first two seasons of True Detective, the first three seasons of True Detective, not the fourth season, but uh, I can't remember his name right now. But especially after watching season one and, and just the kind of things that that are alluded to there um, regarding massive ch uh, child sexual exploitation by power, the powerful, uh, just. You, you just can't help but wonder what these people know and maybe they're trying to tell us about stuff that's just this this is this is a thesis that can't really be uh, uh, finally confirmed as true or false it's just something that it's just something that uh, crossed my mind it's an annoying person with a leaf blower. Might have to put this on pause for a second. 
until I pass him here. <laughs> so <laughs> the powers that be just said, oh no, Nowicki's spitting too much truth. Quick, let's send some annoying leaf blower person to, uh, to drown him out <laughs> and, and let him know that he needs to stop talking about these things. Huh. Well, um, the reason why, I mean, I, I was entertaining all of these notions, but, but what, what brought me to really uh, record this video is I'm, I'm thinking back on a book that I read a few years ago called Never Let Me Go. And this is a book by the same author who wrote The Remains of the Day. I can't remember his name right now. I apologize for that. He's a big deal. He's a, a famous author. Um, and it's a great book. But I started, I started to think of that, about that book in ways that I, like, uh, cryptic ways, uh, esoteric ways that I'd never thought about it before. So the book is about, it's set in a future where uh, we, we meet with this group of, of kids in, a strange, in an unusual school, and we don't really know what's going on with them, but things, something's slightly off. Um, and then eventually what we find out, okay, spoilers, but hell, the book's, I don't know, 20 years old now. Uh, and I think you can hear the spoiler and still enjoy the book. I do recommend it. Uh, but but what, they, what, what you find out near the end is that these, these children are clones of actual people. And they, they were created for the express purpose of, you know, if the, if the actual person has some kind of health problem and he needs a new liver, let's say, then the child who was created with his DNA is, uh, is made to, they, 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 they uh, extract his liver and give it to the, to the actual person. And so, you know, these, that's why these kids don't really live too long because eventually they just get operated on. They get so many things removed and eventually they, they just die off. And it's incredibly powerful indictment of the culture of death of the, um, the, 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 the notion of once you go down the route of creating human life, uh, as a means to an end, uh, that, that the kind of atrocities that will, that will become, uh, that will just become a natural, like a, like a, they'll just blend in with the wallpaper. Uh, people don't really have wallpaper anymore. They'll just blend in with the scenery. So that's, that's a better, better metaphor. They'll just become, oh yeah, well, I'm having some problem. My, my heart, my heart's not the greatest, but don't worry. I've got, I've got my, my extra guy, uh, who's now a healthy 18 year old and, you know, I'll just take his heart and I'll be great. I'll, you know, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll salvage my, my existence. And, you know, so, so ordinary, regular people, people who are lucky enough not to be cloned, you know, or maybe living 110, 120, 130 years, you know, it's becoming more and more normal to just live, live uh, long, long lives because you can extract the resources from your, from your clone, who the clone who was created for you, for your convenience. And of course, just, just, just reading it non-esoterically, it's powerful enough. It's a powerful enough indictment of the culture of what I'm calling the culture of death. I don't know whether the author was, had that in mind or not, but I'm saying that's what effectually it is. Um, but when you think, when I'm, when I was starting to think about Ellis and how his works could be read esoterically as, you know, from the point of view of somebody who, who has access to 
the elites and knows what they're up to, uh, but also can't say things too explicitly uh, for obvious reasons, but who drops little hints, you know, in his work that reality isn't what we think it is. And, and there are things that maybe we take for granted as being real because we're told, told that it's the case on the news and then, but then maybe it's not so real. Maybe the reality is something very different from what we're being told and infinitely more sinister than what we're being told. And so when I think about that with respect to, with respect to uh, this, this novel, uh, Never Let Me Go, I think about things like, like um, child sacrifices. I think about children who maybe were conceived. I mean, this is this is pretty heavy stuff. This is. I mean, it, it, this is gonna if you if you if you're in a if your soul is in a sensitive place, then don't you don't necessarily want to think about this kind of stuff. Um, and I don't, I'm taking a chance even thinking about it now because my soul is always in a rather sensitive place. Um, but when, when you hear about things like, you know, children being conceived in, uh, you know, these, these evil ritualistic settings, um, you know, the, the elite, uh, raping the young and, and possibly intentionally uh, conceiving children and those children ending up in these care homes or these orphanages and then of course it's open season on them because they're just extra or maybe they're they're just maybe these maybe children like that are just never never even acknowledged they're they're never given a um you know, what we in the United States would call a social security number. They're never even acknowledged as, as people. They're, they're born enti entirely secret beings. And they're, they're just there for, for the, uh, the sick elites to, uh, to use and use up. And yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm, well, I haven't said this yet, but I, I hope that this is, I hope I'm just wrong. I hope I'm wrong about this. I hope I'm just reading too much into it and, and what have you. But I, I don't know. We've seen so much lately. So much of what's true has come to light. So much of what was once hidden has come to light. Um, and the metaphor just works. It, it works so easily. It works so effortlessly. You know, like just 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 change a few details, pro uh, project it into the future. Uh, you know, have it be about medical procedures. Uh, you know, with with clones who are who aren't acknowledged as human and, and who are just there to to give up their organs uh, until they expire. You don't even call it death because you don't even consider them to be alive. Uh, uh, you just who just are required to give up their organs to to uh, supplement the lives of of the quote unquote real people, the ones who weren't weren't born in a lab. It's just the the, the metaphor just works so perfectly. It's such a heavy thought, and I really hope it's not true. And that's where I'll end this video. <laughs>